All right, this should be physics 2-7-C, Blake. Uh, we're still on flip chart physics 2-7, right now on page 12 of that. Uh, we just finished the introduction to inelastic collisions and an inelastic collision lab. We're going to continue with inelastic collisions by turning to page 221 here in a moment. But first, there's a proof in here of how do you know that the momenta are equal to the momenta? The sum of these momenta are equal to the sum of these momenta. Well, then these momentums, or momenta, are equal and opposite. The, the change in velocity between these is equal to the change in velocity between these. And since momentum is force times change in time, is equal to this momentum over here. So we're saying that, I think I should have a negative sign here. That the impulse is equal to the impulse, which is Newton's third law restated. There's no way that you can have the impulse of two colliding objects be different. You can't have more force and time on one than you can on the other. That's fundamental to the way the universe works. That's why it's a third law. It's never been an exception found. Even when you're monkeying around with relativity, we still use this one. Can't get around that one. Okay, let's continue with page 221, 1A. A 44 kilogram student on inline skates is playing with a 22 kilogram exercise ball. So the masses are in a two to one ratio. As a matter of fact, this is two thirds of the mass. This is one third of the mass. So I expect this to have two thirds of the velocity change and this to have one third of the velocity change. Students holding the ball, both are at rest, throws the ball horizontally, causing the student to glide back at 3.5 meters per second. So the student should have one-third of the velocity change, the ball should have two-thirds of the velocity change. So when you work it out, the ball comes out to be minus seven. Exactly what we expected. Okay, to start with, the momentum of the kid and the ball, everything is zero. The ball has to be 22 times kilograms times the uh, final velocity for object one, the kid is 44 kilograms times 3.5. This positive number taken to the other side, dividing, you're going to get a negative 7.0. So the ball will move away from the student at 7.0 meters per second. B asks, explain what happens to the ball in terms of the momentum of the student and the momentum of the ball. There's a couple ways you could say this. One, their momentum was zero to start with, so the momentum when they're done is still zero, because if this one's positive and that one's negative, they're equal and opposite, it's still zero. Another way of saying it, the momentum gained by the ball must be equal to and opposite the momentum gained by the student. C, the student is initially at rest and the student catches the ball, which is moving to the right. Well, then they're both going to move together in an inelastic collision like the lab. So if this is 4.6 meters per second, it catches it, should slow down to 1.53 meters per second. If you drop this down to a third of its velocity, that's what this is. Now, that's a little bit fancy, but if you start off with 2.2 kilograms times 4.6 meters per second, plus nothing, has to equal 22 plus 44, all the mass times the shared velocity, because now they're together. When you divide over, you get 1.53 meters per second. D, explain what happens in terms of the momentum of the student and the momentum of the ball. Well, momentum is conserved. It stays the same. The student's initial momentum is zero. 
When the student catches the ball, some of the momentum is transferred to the student. Actually, the ball will keep a third of it, and this student would keep two-thirds of the momentum. Boy stands at one end of a floating raft stationary, walks in a straight line to the opposite end of the raft. Does the raft move? Yeah, if the raft is stationary and you go this way, the raft would go this way. Center of mass of the system would remain where it is, by the way. Yes, the raft moves. The total momentum starts at zero, so if you give yourself a positive momentum this way, the raft must have a negative momentum that way that cancels when they add back together. So the total must remain zero to be conserved. The boy and the raft must move in opposite directions, one positive and one negative, in order for momentum to be conserved. Well, does this work if you are riding on a rowboat? Yes. Does this work if you're riding on a houseboat? Yes, but the houseboat, boat, houseboat with a, on the houseboat goes real slow. It's a very small acceleration because this mass is very big. Does this work when you walk on the planet Earth? Yes. But the Earth doesn't really gain a significant amount of velocity the other way because your mass is so tiny compared to the Earth's enormous mass. But momentum is still conserved. What is the total momentum of the boy in the raft before the boy walks across the raft? Zero. What is it afterwards? Zero. One's positive, one's negative. Number three. High-speed stroboscopic photographs show the head of golf club traveling at 55 meters per second. Use the law of conservation of momentum to find the speed of the golf ball just after impact. This is not an inelastic collision, but it doesn't have to be. This is an elastic collision. And that's okay. We're showing conservation of momentum. The golf ball has this momentum before. Sorry, the golf ball has zero momentum sitting on the tee. The golf club has this momentum. When the golf club hits the ball, it slows down a little bit goes from 55 to 42, and the ball takes off at what speed, okay? So momentum is conserved. You know, the total momentum before, and this one was zero, is equal to the total momentum of this one plus this one. When you solve for that, the ball goes off at 61 meters per second. Now the golf club only slows down by seven meters per second. The golf ball speeds up by 61 meters per second. Why? Because its mass is much less. <coughs> <coughs> Hopefully, that collision is, el as, is as elastic as you can get it. At least if you're a golfer, hopefully. I don't particularly care. Number four. We're not going to do part E on number four. I don't want to have to explain it at this point in this chapter. Two isolated objects have a head-on collision. Explain your answer. If you know the change in momentum of one object, can you find the change in the momentum of the other one? Sure. Any momentum lost by the first particle will be gained by the second, and vice versa. Two. If you know the initial and final velocity of one object and the mass of the object, do you have enough information to find the final velocity of the second object? No. You need the mass of both objects and the initial velocity of both objects and the final velocity of one of the objects in order to find the final velocity of the other one. So what you need is mass of both, initial of both. Let me jump ahead here. Way ahead. 
There's a video I had you watch. And I was in that video coming up with these equations. Now look at what you have. Mass of both objects are known. Velocity of both objects are known. Because the second one, in order to use these equations, is zero. That's when these equations work. And the first one is here and here. So you have both velocities, initial, both masses, <coughs> and in that special case where one's zero, you can actually find both, both of them. That's a special case. So let's go back to here. You have to have both initial velocities, both masses, and one in the finals. And you will see that in the lab, in the elastic collision lab. We're going to look for one of the finals. You have to, in order to do that, you have to have know the other final and all of the initial conditions. Now, in the single equation we've been using, you can only have one known. If you have two unknowns, you must have another equation with the same two unknowns. That's what made this work back here. How did I have, how did I know I didn't have either final velocity? So I didn't have either final velocity, I had two unknowns. Well, what made this work is we conserved, if you went back through that video and watched me do it, I conserved momentum, that's an equation, and I conserved kinetic energy, that's a second equation with the same two unknowns. And I did a lot of jumping through hoops to do a two equations, two unknowns. So that's why it works in this special case. Okay. C. If you know the masses of both objects and the final velocities of both objects, do you have enough information to find the initial velocities of both objects. No, that's the same thing in reverse. You'd have to have one of them or have two equations with the same two unknowns. Number four, if you know the masses and initial velocities of both objects and the final velocity of one, do you have enough to find the other one? Yes, and that, as a matter of fact, that's what we're doing in the elastic collision lab coming up. And we're gonna skip number E. This, this is enough to digest right there. I mean, if you can explain how I derived those equations in the video, then that can get you to those questions. Whoops. Okay. How much time do I have left here? I got some. Okay. Uh, Where does this go next? Practice 6E problems. These are inelastics. So we're back to inelastics again. You have a 1,500 car, kilogram car traveling at 15 meters per second, collides with a 4,500 kilogram truck. That's a rest, they stick together. What's the final velocity? It should be uh, three and three quarters. Okay, because this is three times the mass of this, so this should have three fourths. This should have three fourths the velocity. This should have one fourth, of, well, this should have three, Force the velocity, one fourth the velocity, but it's the same velocity. So, they'll cut that in quarters, I guess, since that's zero. 1,500 kilograms times 15, zero, add it together, the total is 6,000. So it's a quarter of 15. 3.75, rounds to 3.8 meters per second south. Grocery shopper tosses a bag of ice into the grocery cart. The bag's going five and a half meters per second. What's the speed of the cart and the bag? So the bag's nine kilograms going at 50 or 5.5 meters per second. The cart is sitting there at zero meters per second with a mass of 18 kilograms. That's two thirds of the mass, one third of the mass. We're gonna cut that by threes. 27 kilograms is the total. So for B, it's going to move at 
meters per second forward. So this is zero, just divided by 27. Okay, number three. An elastic collusion again. <clears throat> Here's our conservation of momentum. As this is written, it works for elastic and inelastic and everything in between that we're not going to look at. <coughs> railroad car moving at 7 meters per second sticks to another railroad car, same mass, moving in the same direction at 1.5 meters per second. What's the velocity of the joined cars after the collision? Well, one is going 15,000 kilograms times 7 meters per second. The other is 15,000 kilograms times one half meters per second. Both masses is 30,000 kilograms. Solve for that and the final answer ends up being 4.5 or 4.3 meters per second. And apparently that was normal. My number doesn't sound right. Uh, the book answer is four meters per second times the north, and as I am looking at this, I'm seeing a difference of 5.5. 5.5 cut half should be two and three quarters added on to one and a half. So I have 4.3, the book says 4.0. I'm sure what happened there. One of those is right, one is, and I'll check it on the paper when I'm done. Dry cleaner throws 22 kilogram bag of laundry uh, into a nine kilogram cart that's sitting there. When they're done, it's moving at three meters per second to the right and the total mass is 31. So how fast was the laundry going? Well, that's zero. So it's 93 divided by 22 comes out to be 4.2 meters per second. And last, number five, 47.4 kilogram student runs down the sidewalk, jumps onto a skateboard with no momentum. What's the mass of the skateboard? Well, we know that when they're done, they're moving to 3.95. We don't know what the skateboard's mass is, but we know the student's new mass is 47.4 times 3.95. And the skateboard is also 3.95 times m. So we multiply this, multiply this, subtract off, then divide by 3.95. It comes out to be 3.0 kilograms. How fast would the student have to jump to have a final speed of 5 meters per second? Well, the combined mass, now we know, is 50.4 kilograms, going at 5 meters per second. The skateboard still has no momentum. So it would be the student's mass times the student's velocity is 220, 202, divided by 47.4, which is 5.32 meters per second. I'm going to stop there because I think the next thing is going into...